Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Monica Profit. Hello and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I'm here with Clark Varen, the co-founder of Muvele and Travel Young Adventure Camping Trips. Hi, Clark. Thanks so much <laughs> for joining us. <laughs> hey, thank you, Monica. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I know that adventure camping trips doesn't really fit into this whole like we're talking about finance. It's more like, OK, and so you had some other kind of company, but I know it does fit in. So I thought it would be good to make sure we we mentioned it a little bit. But I want to start with this co-founder of Muvele because that's a little more recent. Can you tell me what Muvele is? Yeah, so Muvele is Muvule. a microfinance institution in Uganda. So the whole point of Mavule is in order to empower people who have literally no resources. They, they have nothing to their name, uh, but they want to make money. And unemployment is really high in Uganda. So if we give them a tiny loan, even just $100, so that they can go buy something to, to resell, then they can start to create a job and work their way out of poverty. So it's really all about like economic development and uh, women empowerment, because 90% of the people who take out our loans are women. Why is that, do you think, that most of the lendees are women? Well, I think it's because uh, women, first of all, they repay their loans. That's the number one thing. <laughs> <laughs> men men uh, typically don't. And after spending a lot of time actually meeting with our clients one-on-one, -on -one, I realized why. And it has to come down to the psychology of men and women. Women are a lot more fear driven. So they will not like spend their money frivolous, frivolously. They won't go buy beer for themselves and whatnot. They're also a lot more caring. So they put a lot more into the communities. They'll reinvest in their children's education. They'll reinvest into building their home. When they have a little bit of money, they, they spend it wisely. Men, on the other hand, are a lot more shame driven. And uh, we really don't like to talk about our financial problems because it's it takes away from our manlyhood of I can provide for the family, you know. But when something's wrong, they tend to hide their problems because there's so much shame involved with it. And so as like a financial institution, if we know about your problems, we can typically help you or we can give you some kind of resources or whatnot. Um, but if you don't tell us something's going wrong and you just hide the problem, then you're more likely to default. And you can't, you can't get help if you don't ask for help or even mention that you need help, right? So, Yeah, exactly. So women are a lot more open about their problems. Men tend to bury under the rug. Yeah, if that's true. I guess I've, I've noticed that. It sounds like you're, you're, I mean, even though you're really talking about potential, you know, uh, lendies or like, you know, applicants in Uganda, it sounds like you're also maybe describing most of my boyfriends in my 20s. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before I was like, you can't date potential. Never mind. If it's already a problem, it'll stay a problem. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, that's a funny great. way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're like, and here's the psychology of men. I was like, yes, very much. Like, yes, I agree 100%. Um, well, how did you, I know that the story of how you got to Uganda in the first place, I mean, to open up, you know, it's not, you pardon me for saying this, but you don't seem like you're you know, long in the tooth. Like you're not exactly like wise into this you know, level of 40 or 50 year old entrepreneur here. So going to Uganda and opening uh, a micro lending platform and a, a basically a micro lending bank is, is that's a pretty lofty ambition. It says something about your background. How on earth did you end up so comfortable in a place like Uganda? Yeah. So that goes back to my college days because I actually started uh, Mavule, right after I graduated college, I booked a one-way ticket to Turkey and then Egypt and then Uganda. And then I finally found my perfect business partner in Uganda. Uh, but the reason why I was in the right place 
right after college in order to do this was because I started this company, Travel Young, which exposed me to poverty all over the world. I was guiding these high adventure camping trips, you know, jumping off bridges in Ecuador, backpacking in Patagonia, things like that. And Tough life. That really sounds yeah, like a crappy no situation. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but you can imagine, like, as a college student, I spent every vacation doing my absolute dream. I felt so grateful for what I had. And while I was traveling all over the world, living the absolute dream, I saw all these people who had zero opportunity. And I looked back on my own business and I, I saw that it took me about a $700 loan on a credit card in order to start my travel agency. And I started it small and it became something pretty big. And I was really passionate about helping entrepreneurs at that time because I was one myself. And so I, I just was touched by poverty. I was touched by my own opportunity. I wanted to help entrepreneurs. I said, you know what, why not help entrepreneurs in emerging markets who work so freaking hard yet have so little opportunity that it takes forever for them to like climb up the ladder. If I can get them to the point where they can climb up the ladder a little faster, then that would make me feel really good. And so I learned about microfinance for about a year. And then right when I graduated school, I was like, all right, I'm going to go start this microfinance company. And I went to Uganda, which is what I, what I read was it was the best microfinance market in the world. And so that was just a, an ideal place for me to start. And through my connections from Travel Young, I actually had one guy there uh, who was a safari operator. And he ended up becoming my business partner in the microloan business. And it was just like a dream come true, like perfect fit. So why is it that Uganda is um, considered the best market for micro lending? Well, the way micro lending works is you don't give a loan to an individual, you give it to a group of people. So if you want to give out uh, micro loans, instead of giving an individual 200 bucks, you would give five people a thousand dollars and they're responsible for paying it back as a community. Okay. And so if the five people are responsible for paying back the thousand dollars, if one person defaults, the other four people still have to pay that thousand dollars. And in order for that model to work, you need to have really communal uh, social structures. And so in places like Southeast Asia and in Africa, where they're very community, community oriented versus being individualistic, micro lending works super well because it's more of like, a, hey, I know you had a genuine problem paying you back your micro loan this time. I'm going to get you this time knowing that when I have a genuine problem, you guys are, are going to cover me, right? And so Uganda has the highest rate of forming groups of any country in Africa. Huh. They're, the, they're the most communal country in all of sub-Saharan Africa, which is one of the most communal regions in the world. And there's a really high rate of uh, single mothers which is who we mostly serve because of the history of wars and disease. And so it's just a place where it needs a lot of help. There's a lot of women who need help and you can go in with a little bit of money and you can do, you can create a huge impact. Now, do you just wondering about this as a person of, of course, like enormous first world privilege or a developed country, developed nation privilege, like, are you, do you do fundraising and do you micro micro fundraising from people here to be able to enable like loans to happen there and like kind of a Kiva model? Or do you mostly do large, you know, deployment of capital into the, into your bank and then you guys just manage it? Yeah, we have basically three ways of raising funds. The reason why, the biggest reason why we don't raise a lot of investment capital in small chunks is because of the SEC regulation in the States. Nice. So the SEC blocks us from being able to accept money from anyone who's not an accredited investor. And so that's a big reason why we say, all right, if we have to go through all this trouble dealing with the SEC and whatnot, then we should have a pretty high minimum of what a minimum investment can be. So our minimum investment is 25 grand and you can earn a 10% return on that. Anyone who wants to put in less than 25 grand, we just ask for it to be a donation. And then we'll actually donate the 10% that would have come back to them as an investment to Moses's school. So my business partner, Moses, he started a school in Uganda and, uh, and we support that school through the profits that we make through microloans, which is really cool because now we have like a mix of education and 
financial inclusion, which is a great way to, to grow an economy, right? And then the third way is specific to people who are in the crypto community. And this is a recent partnership that I actually am engaging in with a family office in Dubai. Basically, anyone who has Ethereum can stake their Ethereum into this family office's liquidity pools, and then they will earn 1.125% per week as a return in Ethereum. And then Movule also earns 1.125% per week as a donation to uh, fund our operations and give out loans. So that's actually the best way for us to raise money. If someone has Ethereum, they can get a really high return. And then Movule also gets a lot of donations, which are obviously better than money that we have to pay back. Does the person who, this is like really, really specific, and I'm not sure if you can speak to the tax implications of this, but I know, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the crypto community about tax implications of capital gains and also different types of uh, activities that maybe before were not really considered uh, taxable events in the past, and now they may be. And there's been a lot of back and forth by the Biden administration about that. But needless to say, there's been a lot of discussion around taxes. If a person was to make that investment, would they get the tax benefit of the donation or does that go pass through to the family office? You know, that's a really good question. I think that, uh, I think that we could, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a firm answer for you, but I think that we could give the tax uh, donation to the person who's staking the Ethereum. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, because of the way that it's set up, I, I'm pretty sure that would be the case, but I'm not entirely positive and I, I'd have to check with the family office. Hey, if you, we can always do a round two and go back to this, but, um, you know, you heard it here first. This is the first place that I can imagine anyone can stake their crypto and get a built-in potential, likely, uh, tax incentive. I mean, I, a lot of people live here in Puerto Rico, so we can just erase the need to talk about taxes uh, with crypto because it's... <laughs> It's so complicated to keep up with. It's hard to even know, you know, to track everything. If you're if you're trading often in the markets on platforms that mm -hmm. don't give you, you know, lots of reporting, you can be easily in trouble just by not having the information that you need because you didn't track it yourself constantly. It's it can be a real nightmare. But to to think that you could actually just put your money somewhere and also automatically get a repeated and re recurring, you know, tax um, tax deduction is pretty cool. That's that's really neat. yeah. Yeah, it is super cool. I'm going to verify that and I'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah. Verify it. And we'll just throw it in the show notes as, as it comes in and we'll just add that in as we can, but that's awesome. Or we'll just do it in round two. We'll have to, unfortunately, we'll have to talk again. That's terrible. This is really no fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that like decentralized finance and especially in micro lending is a pretty new space. Um, and to anyone who's, you know, I mean, most of our, of our audiences in the U S most of our audience is crypto curious at the very least, uh, we don't always like dive into every single detail, like taxes, like I do, but, um, but, you know, we try to make sure that this is accessible to people that are, this might be the first thing they ever consume the first piece of anything about crypto that they consume. So it's always nice to be like, if you were just a user, what would that be like? And it's great to see what you're creating for users in Uganda, um, but in terms of what you're doing on a larger scale to really shift microfinance from centralization to decentralization, what does that look like? I mean, I don't, I don't even know how to really frame the question. I'm not sure many of my audience members would either. But if, if we're going to talk about centralized microfinance, how does that really shift uh, operationally and you know, in the, its end execution when it becomes decentralized? Yeah, so if you think about a centralized execution, uh, a centralized microfinance institution. That's what I currently run. That's what the whole industry looks like right now. And we're essentially like banks. And so we can serve people who live near the bank really well, because when we go out, we have to, we have to do due diligence on people. We have to see their business and whatnot. Uh, we basically have to become a part of the community in order to give out a loan effectively. If, we're, if we don't understand the community, then it's very likely that we would default. And that leaves a huge portion of people who don't live in urban areas. They live in rural areas. They're farmers and whatnot. People who are in the most extreme poverty, it basically excludes them from being able to have access to loans. And if they do have access to loans, it's at a very expensive interest rate because the institution has to travel long distances in order to do due diligence and then in order to do collections. And so it's a very expensive access to capital if they have it at all. But with decentralized microloans, the idea would be that people, even in these very remote areas, 
would be able to have access to cheap capital. They'd be able to borrow a little bit of money in order to invest in their farm and whatnot. And uh, those people are completely unserved right now. They have no other alterna alternatives. So the way that it would work is that instead of going to a bank, you would go to your friends and family and you would ask them, hey, I want to get a loan. Would you be willing to back me? Would you be willing to stake collateral on my behalf? And then you get a few friends together and they say, hey, yeah, well, we support you. Like we know that you're you're going to put it to good use. You're not going to you know, waste your money. And so they get the community to stake collateral on their behalf. And then they get access to a loan from a decentralized lending pool. And by doing that, the people who are staking the collateral actually earn an interest rate because their money is being staked into a liquidity pool, which is earning yield. But the borrower doesn't have to pay an interest rate. The profit is no longer coming from the borrower paying back you know, their 200 bucks plus interest. The profit is coming back from, hey, while my money is staked, it's, it's making earning transaction fees. You know, it's earning yield. And so this is a really cool way for communities in order to support their local friends and family where they can invest their money, they can earn interest without having to charge their their friend who they're lending their money any interest at all. Or they can even invest so, just their collateral and still earn on that, correct? Yeah, exactly. Right. That's exactly. amazing. Talk about a liquidity pool that's opened up. Yeah. And so what I'm doing with Mavule is this this company, by the way, the decentralized lending network um, that created this technology. I'm I'm partnering with them because the way that they plan on introducing their technology into emerging markets is by using microfinance institutions, the institutions who are already doing the microloans, to just start staking collateral on behalf of their borrower. For the microfinance institution, they get an extra three percent return. Oh my god! For yeah, instead of lending it directly to the borrower, they stake it into lending pool, they get an extra 3% return. And then the borrower doesn't have to pay any more interest. And so it's a really good way to start introducing this technology into the borrowers. And then once these borrowers have enough wealth within their own communities, then they can start, they can start doing the fully decentralized lending, where it's just their friends and family who are staking the collateral. That's amazing. That's incredible. And the fact that you already have kind of an infrastructure, you're part of an infrastructure that is the provides them the reach and they have the back end, the technology all worked out, worked out that kind of allows you to bring a new product to market. It's just such a wonderful marriage. What is the name of that organization? The Decentralized Lending Network. Their website is dln.org. All right, we'll make sure to put that in the show notes too. That's really cool. And as a, a user here stateside, can we engage the DLN in some way as well? Or do you have to be a part of a micro lending sort of ecosystem? No, there's actually going to be a release. It's not open yet, um, but investors will be able to come in and they'll be able to uh, provide liquidity in order to give out these loans. And so they will earn an impact adjusted return. It's not going to be your most profitable investment, but hey, you can put in a few hundred bucks and know that you're helping people across the world earn their way out of poverty. That's really cool. I mean, the Calvert, uh, what is it? Calvert Impact and Stock, stock. Uh, there's a, a stock fund called the Calvert Fund or whatever. And it's the only mm -hmm. impact fund that I could find when I was first trading and investing back in, I don't know, a long time ago. And I was like, oh, that's nice. It's the only one that's like, we won't invest in oil. That's all we know what to do. And it was such, so sad. It was like, we'll invest in McDonald's. I'm like, doesn't really mark the mark, guys. <laughs> but it, I guess it's better than oil. I don't know. You know, but this is a, uh, you know, I, I've, I've done many investments where there was just impact adjusted returns, meaning just making less money. Right. But um, mm -hmm. but also sleeping at night and knowing that you're doing good. So that's very cool. Mm -hmm. How did you end up so altruistic? Like, how did it how did it occur to you? Was it really just you, you were so um, exposed to poverty and it surprised you and you had not seen it before? And then you were like, whoa, and like you just got excited to do something about it. Or was it, you know, were your parents like big UNICEF donors? Like, how did this happen? <laughs> This is a this is a tricky question because a lot of people don't like him, but I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan, and he has a big uh, he has a big message that is like the secret to living is giving, and he ingrained that into me at an early enough age where it's just like in my neural system now. So, yeah, I think 
I think it's right. Like at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, we're going to end up, you know, passing on only our impact in this world. There's nothing material to pass on. Right. So, uh, I've, I have looked back at some of the memories where I go back to Uganda and I see the change that we're making. And it's like, those are my happiest memories yeah. period. Yeah. And so, uh, that feeling is what life is all about. And, you know, Tony Robbins, people can look down at him all they want or think he's a big rah-rah guy, but I'm sorry, can, how much can you hate someone who's going to try to promote, you know, people giving as a part of their life goals? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that just seems yeah. a little odd, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a Tony Robbins fan too. Oddly enough, I see a lot of things I could criticize about him, but you know, I can't a lot about a lot of human beings. So especially the more in the public eye you are, the more you're going to get criticism. So. Yeah, of course. So let's see. Um, I want to make sure I hit kind of the, the, um, the high, the high notes here. I know you went into like what was happening with um, 0% loans, but again, I just want to like reinforce that because, you know, right now, I don't think I know anybody. I, I have maybe some, I have some debt maybe sitting on a credit card that's at a, a promotional rate for a little while at 0%. And I always look for those things. And I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to take advantage of that. But that's it. I mean, mm -hmm. free money or money that doesn't cost you any extra money to have is, is just not hard to find, especially it seems like it's so much more expensive to be poor than rich and, you mm -hmm. know, ex money gets more and more expensive and difficult to find if you don't, if you don't need a lot of it, if you're not looking for much and if you can't mm -hmm. pay back much, but the idea that people in this, you know, in such a struggling position would end up with 0% loans. Is this something that you're thinking of bringing to more markets than just the emerging markets in the, of the world? Oh yeah, no, this is something that if you're in the States and you want to start a business and you want to go to your friends and family and, and do like a fundraise, you can ask them to put some money in and you tell them, Hey, I will, I'm not going to pay any interest, but through the liquidity pool, you'll earn at least 3%. And then you'll be able to support me, start up my, you know, family business or whatnot. And I think that like, you make a really good point. Um, it's an impact adjusted return, right? So you're not going to use this as like your primary way in order to earn money. But here's the crazy thing. There's like $500 trillion in the world economy today. And there's about a $5 trillion gap in the access to credit that these, um, that these really poor entrepreneurs need, That's that micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises need. And so if everyone staked 1% of their portfolio, into something that they weren't donating it, but they were just plopping it there and it earned them it, it earned them 3% interest instead of, you know, 3% interest, that's still pretty good for 1% of your portfolio. If everyone did that, every business, every individual did that, then we would completely solve the uh, financial inclusion gap, which is the number one way to eradicate poverty. So anyone who's considering this, consider doing 1%. That is incredible. Absolutely. I, I love this. And doing 1% would be on the dln.org website. That would be the easiest place to do this and get an, an income impact, sorry, impact adjusted return, right? Yes, exactly. So it's funny, you come on as like the co-founder of Movule, which I mispronounced in the beginning. I'm going to mispronounce it every, every time I imagine, but then you end up like really evangelizing this other company. Can you talk a little bit about how that happened? Cause I, I know you've told me over drinks before, but how did you end up in this position where, you know, you're really talking about a company that's not your company necessarily, but it's really, it's such a good add on to the company that you've made. Yeah. So I was actually introduced into the crypto world earlier this year. Uh, and I quickly got into it, like very, very quickly caught up. I remember the first time that we met was kind of one of my like eye opening moments. <laughs> and <laughs> and then um, I started attending all these conferences around the world and I started reading books. and I, I started thinking, how does this apply to emerging markets? Because everyone's talking about how it's going to be the solution to bank the unbanked. Yet I haven't seen anything happen yet. Yeah. And so I actually went deep into the technology, really educated myself. And then I wrote a white paper on DeFi microloans. And then I started speaking about this at different conferences. And at one of the conferences in Dubai, someone came up to me and said, hey, you know what? I invested in this company. It sounds like they do exactly like what you're talking about. You should meet with him. And I know you're looking for your tech co-founder. Maybe he could be the tech co-founder. And this could be 
the startup that you get involved with. Wait, can I so just I pause right here for a second? Because so yeah. many people would look at that and think, what, my com- competition? He's already doing what I'm doing. You know, so many people would go, oh my gosh, he might steal my ideas or maybe he's, and instead this like, back to maybe a little Tony Robbins or stuff, this abundance mindset of like collaboration instead of competition. Like we mm-hmm. could have so much that we could share. Maybe he could fill in the gaps. Maybe we could be better together than alone. That's not everyone's knee jerk reaction to hearing that someone else is doing what you're thinking of doing, Right. But that, I guess I have to like point this out. Like that's kind of incredible on its own that you would see that opportunity. I mean, some, some entrepreneurs take it that way and some take it the other way and they go back into their little hole and say, I need NDAs. I need this and that, you know, and you just for you to like go, yeah, I want to meet him. This could be amazing. It just sounds mm-hmm. like a very, a unique thing that I don't see in every single, you know, kind of area of the economy or of people and personalities. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's totally true. I've I've had the belief that your competition is your best collaboration for my entire career in business. Like when I started Movule, I added every employee of every single one of my competitors on LinkedIn and I begged them for help and advice because I was like, I'm getting in way over my head here. I've got a business in Uganda. I don't know what I'm doing. I need advice. I need a board of Help advice. me. I'm trying to do <laughs> <Help> good. <me. laughs> Oh my gosh, that was a fun time. But yeah, I, I met with him and he's like, yeah, I've got the tech 90% built. Uh, we're going to be ready to start launching in, in quarter one. And uh, and I was like, this is so perfect. Like, this is exactly what I want to do. And I've got a lot of stuff where I am the champion of it. You know, I'm the I'm the CEO, I'm the, I'm the head of it. This is really great because I'm going to be a supporter of the decentralized lending network but I also don't have to put 100% of all my time and effort into it. I can just put as much time into it as I have. And so that is one of the reasons why I'm a big advocate of it is because I plan on joining their team as like a part-time consultant and advisor. And and really my company is going to be spreading the DLN across sub-Saharan Africa. We're going to, we're going to be huge evangelists, uh, not only in Uganda, but all across sub-Saharan Africa. That's fantastic. I mean, talk about accelerating the growth of what you're looking to make and just by finding the right people to be along with you. I feel the same way. I just think maybe it's also that you mostly serve so many women, not to gender it too much, but I do see this general like collaborative approach that women have learned that they have to have. Maybe it's just born out of childcare that you can't just be awake every, you know, two hours round the clock for months and months and months on end and have nobody to help you. And, you know, you just can't let somebody go wither on the vine and let their child suffer too. You you just have to get, you have to jump in and help in some way. And so that, that collaborative approach just sounds like it's pretty, um, it's part and parcel to who you are, which is, it's just lovely to see. It doesn't happen often. I don't hear from a lot of people that they're that sensitive to the need for people to work in groups for them to, to really sustain, whether it's in who you will lend to and how, or how you structure a loan or how you're structuring your businesses. So where are you kind of going now? It sounds like you've got your fingers in a lot of bowls. Are there any other pieces that you're looking to round this out with? Yeah, well, man, this is going to be a broad, broad topic uh, podcast. But in addition to poverty eradication, I think the second biggest passion I have is uh, regarding energy. And so I have also been thinking about how can I uh, start to get more uh, like broadly minded, like include energy into my portfolio as well. So without getting into too much detail, that's one big thing that I'm thinking about as well. Um, and I think if I do that, then it would make for one pretty killer, like uh, sustainable development goal consultant at some point in the future. <laughs> I think you'll do a lot more than just consult at that point. But I have a feeling he might be doing more than consulting. Yeah. So um, does the energy piece of it, does it, um, does it fit in because you see poverty and energy closely related or poverty? I mean, I think about like the people invest in utilities because they're like defensive stocks because people are going to like the users are going to pay their heating bill because they don't want to go cold. Right. They, they will default on lots mm-hmm. of things, but they won't default on that. And I wonder if just because that's so close to how we live comfortably on the planet, that 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 energy and poverty are like closely tied. Do you see the two as being closely tied or do you just think they're just two kind of cool things that on their own standalone are cool? No, they are closely tied. Uh, but they're closely tied because the problems that climate change is going to create are going to hurt the poorest people the most. And it's a problem that rich countries 
have created that poor people are going to pay for. And so that's the, that's the tie there. You know, it's not that poor countries are creating the most pollution or whatnot. It might seem like that. Like when I go to Uganda, there's all these motorcycles that are old, cheap motorcycles from China that, that pollute like crazy. And so when you go there, the air quality is really bad in Uganda, at least in the city. But then you look at the statistics of how much carbon emissions do they actually have. It's like a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket. And then the U.S. is like half of all carbon emissions in the world, right? So you look at it and it's like, wow, these are, this is a big problem. The U.S. is causing it. Places like Uganda, poverty actually was going down f- until about five years ago in Uganda. Uh, it went from like 85% to about 15% in like 20 wow. years, which was huge. Like you can imagine that's huge poverty eradication happening in just 20 years. And then all of a sudden it started going up again, not up slowly either. It's going up by 1% per year from 15% to 20% over the last five years. And the biggest reason is because of extended drought periods. Uganda's a country that they have seasonal droughts, but now the soil is getting drier because as the climate warms up, it evaporates water out of the soil, makes the soil drier, it makes it harder to grow crops, and it's making the drought season even longer. So now poor people in Uganda are getting, you know, they were getting out of poverty and then they're getting knocked back into poverty if they were in farms. And that's just a big, that's a big issue. And energy is one is one place where you can at least go, let's just track, let's say carbon credits or something that's actually quantifiable and deal with that and see if there can be some way to sort of slow down this accelerated problem. Yeah, so we talked about this a little bit before the show, but the, what I am looking at in terms of energy is really carbon credits because if we want, like the biggest problem is right now we have a trade-off between profitability and sustainability and oil is just super cheap that's basically the big the big problem here and so if and there's other things too um but the the problem is that like whenever we look at okay what's the most profitable option it tends to be what's worse for the environment so with carbon credits and aligning the incentives of profitability with sustainability that's like the core principle of what needs to happen in order for all these other projects to take off. Right. Like if we want more solar farms, if if we want more uh, wind farms and whatnot, we can make it more profitable to create those things by incentivizing them with carbon credits, where it's like, not only are you gonna be able to sell your energy, but you're also gonna be able to sell carbon credits on top of that, which then oil companies are gonna go buy and pharmaceutical companies are gonna go buy. Yeah. And they're, if they can actually have to purchase something to deal with that, then they're at least giving somebody the other end of that purchase an incentive to, to do the right thing and to actually not add to the problem. Exactly. That's incredible. Yeah, it's, all, it's all about incentives. It's all it's about, all about incentives. incentives. Making new incentives is like is, is really the, the only thing to be doing with DeFi, in my opinion. And incentives and governance structures are just my favorite things. Like, how have we already organized ourselves? Why is that? I'm just fascinated with the idea that, you know, you can... You can see the most micro lending really doing well in a place where people act communally in groups of like five to 10, which is amazing to me. I mean, just like, how is it that that's the case? I, I was raised in a hyper individualistic country and, and culture. And so the idea of finding five or 10 people that would truly be that invested in me might be actually a real struggle for me um, mm-hmm. and for most people in the States, but just because of how our culture is made, but other cultures are actually have something, have a greater richness that could be capitalized on strange to use the word capitalist, but like to really, you know, be leveraged and used. Uh, and they actually have an untapped resource or an untapped, ri- untapped richness in just how they govern themselves. And so as I think about DAOs and all these ways that we're using technology to, to organize in a very decentralized manner, I think, can we take the best rules from the best centralized or decentralized historical kind of ways we've organized ourselves and, Im- and just imbue that or, you know, like just embed that into our technology so that we can hopefully use the best of what we've already known of ourselves to just make it go to scale rather than constantly be reinventing the wheel that to look like the wheel we've already seen, but just using slightly different, you know, little levers that we pull. So I'm always interested in like how to make new incentive structures and your incentive structures around microfinance have just been incredible. I never thought that I would end up, you know, just running into someone who's doing like 0% loans. It's like, are you kidding me? Like you sound like a scammer, but you're not, you know, it's great. (laughs) 
<laughs> I just called you a scammer, but I promise I then said you were not. I promise you really are, are not. It just sounds a little too good to be true. And I love that about DeFi. I really love that we're able to start making things hopefully seem a little better than the dim, the, mm-hmm. the dim outcome they've had before. So thank you for your Oh work. my gosh. I, I forgot one more thing too. What? You just mentioned you just mentioned how DeFi always sounds too good to be true. <laughs> um, but investors in the decentralized lending network, not only do they get the yield, the 3% yield from uh, from staking their their collateral or staking their liquidity, uh, but they also get a governance token. And that's really cool because it means that you we're now creating a way uh, where you can actually earn more for the investor. Like we can make it a more profitable uh, thing for the investor. If the, co- if the value of the governance token goes up. Right then you will also be able to earn a higher interest rate. I, I don't know until we actually launch the thing how much it might go up, Yeah, but still... it could make it way more profitable to give out 0% interest loans. <laughs> if you could oh. ever imagine a world where that happens. That's amazing. That's awesome. What is the governance token? What is the, are the call letters or whatever? What's it going to be called? Uh, you know what? Let me get Yellen back token? to you. Let, okay. Yeah. I, no, I, I, we need. I need to talk with the founder about branding because DLN is not a, not a sexy name for it yet. <laughs> I mean, if it's if it's the same as the actual company, I guess. But you're right. Like there might be there might be a better one to use. I've seen a few deflationary tokens that look, seem pretty interesting too. So we can definitely come back to this and do a round two on just how DLN has worked after the launch. If somebody was to want to be involved in DLN now, what could they do? Would they go to DLN.org, and is there any call to action that's there right now? You know what? Yeah, you can follow them on the website, dln.org. And then when there is a big announcement saying, hey, we can now we can now accept investors, uh, then you'll get an email about it. Okay, that's wonderful. So head over to dln.org and see if you can join the investors. Yeah, also, you can follow me on www.clarkvarin.com. And I will also make a big announcement when that happens, because I like to share news about exciting projects like that. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um, we will definitely put the link to your to clarkvarin.com in the show notes as well. Um, I always try to hit on everything that we need to make sure we touch on. It sounds like we've really hit all the highlights. Do you have anything else that you that you want to share before we take off? Now you're on the spot with a super broad question that has no actual like direct answer to it. <laughs> no, I think we covered all of it. All right. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. This has been great. And we've gone a little over time, but I think it's been well worth it to talk about energy, microfinance, eradicating poverty, Tony Robbins, you know, just the, as you do on, in the course of an afternoon. So um, <laughs> it's been a great way to round out the end of 2021. We're going to be putting this out in early 2022. So um, hopefully we'll do a round two and talk more about this stuff as things get going and and 2022 brings bears even more fruit. So thank you, Clark, for joining us. It's been great having you. Fantastic. Thanks, Monica. Well, I will sign off and do my usual. This is Monica Provitt on the New Trust Economy. I'm here with Clark Barron. And thank you so much for listening. We will catch you on the next episode. Take care, you guys. You've been listening to the New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring the new trust economy with us.